All right, let's get started. How's it going, everybody? Good. Spring, spring. Um, again, I don't know what lecture are we on, but it's verification and validation that is consistent with the syllabus. Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, announcements, I guess, for just repeating things that I said on Monday. Uh, we have lab on Friday, as usual. Then next week, we're just gonna do a little bit of review on Monday and Wednesday. There's no official class on Wednesday because it's the exam day. And then instead, there's gonna be a quiz on Brightspace that is gonna be open throughout the day, just like last time, one and a half hours. Um, yeah, and it only covers materials from the second part. So it's not cumulative, it's only uh, to, the, to the heat transfer problems. And yeah, it includes up to today. Any questions? All right, so then let's get started with verification and validation. Uh, I just, since we are kind of wrapping up this second part of the, um, of the course, I just want to say what is it that we are doing that we have done up to now, uh, and just a reminder of sort of the scope of the class. The scope of the class is that most physics come in the form of PDEs uh, that can rarely be solved analytically, and by physics I mean elasticity, heat transfer, uh, electromagnetism, so all of the physics that you usually use as a mechanical engineer uh, will, fluids as well, uh, will come in the form of a partial differential equation, which you can really unlikely solve analytically, except in some simple examples. Uh, so then you have to solve it numerically. And FE is a way to do that. And it works for, more, for all these problems. How does FE work? Uh, it has basically two components that come together to get you a system of equations. One of the components is to massage the PDE a little bit to transform it from this so-called strong form, which is the classical way in which you will find a PDE defined uh, to this weak form. And I've had you do that multiple times. Um, and likely you will get asked something about the strong form to weak form in the exam. Uh, so you know the, the whole idea of the strong form to weak form, you multiply by a weight function, you integrate, you do integration by parts, and then uh, you use the boundary conditions. And the way why it works uh, conceptually is because when we multiply by this weight function and we integrate, that multiplying by the weight function gives us a way of controlling the error. So if you remember the strong form uh, has to be satisfied at every single point. And when we do the multiplication by the weight function and the integrate, then the this weight function, however we pick those weight functions, will allow us to control basically how good we want the approximation to be. So the finer the mesh is, the weight functions are kind of narrower, and then we are isolating the solution in smaller regions, we get better results, but obviously it comes at a computational cost. Uh, so you can have a coarse mesh where the elements are a little bit bigger, the weight functions are a little bit bigger, um, and then you can still get a solution, it's just not as good. So it gives you kind of a way of, of tuning how good your solution is. In the limit where the weight functions become infinitely thin, then you recover the strong form. But obviously that will require, you know, a matrix uh, that is infinitely big for solving that problem. And typically you don't need that accuracy. Uh, so that's the whole idea of the strong form to weak form. Uh, then, you know, weak form still having these weight functions, you can define them in any way that you want, but because you want a code, then you want some sort of easy way of defining the, the weight functions. And so we have been introducing a bunch of different shape functions that we call N, um, which allows us to, to capture the solution and the weight functions. In 1D, we have done linear quadratic elements, and then we started with functions directly in terms of X. 
And those are very convenient because you can directly define them, but they look a little bit ugly and they are bad for doing integrals. And so we said an easy way of doing integrals is by mapping to this size space. So that was the whole idea of going between the shape functions in the terms of X or the shape functions in terms of Psi. For 2D elements, we have done the linear triangles with shape functions in terms of X, Y. And actually by hand, we are only gonna solve problems with the shape functions in terms of X, Y. But I have talked about how you can also have shape functions in this parent domain, Psi eta. Uh, and same for the quadrilaterals. And again, that is convenient because the shape functions usually look, look a lot simpler. And the integrals also are easier because you just read from a table where to evaluate the function. Uh, the problem is that you need to evaluate a lot more things because you need the Jacobian and the inverse of the Jacobian. So you need to evaluate more things. Uh, so, you know, some things are better, some things are, are not great. Uh, we have talked a little bit about numerical integration. And then finally, by putting together the weak form and these uh, shape functions, we can get the definition of the stiffness matrix and the force vector. Uh, and with that, we can, we can do the, um, the big solution of the, of the system of equations. We have been doing it a little bit by hand, and I did a little bit on the Python lab four. And then for the homework five, you will actually do a, you solve the heat transfer problem with in a finite element mesh, similar to what I did for the, for the P problem in the last Python lab. Um, that's sort of all that we have talked about from the theoretical point of view of the class, not, not the abacus part, but the, the Python and the theory. Uh, yeah, this is basically the summary. Uh, so is this really worth it? Because um, I have gotten the comment in the in the course evaluations that oh there's a lot of math there's a lot of programming and there's some other course, and I do want to convince you that it is really worth it for multiple things because at the end of the day you're really never just going to use uh, I mean you might just going and use Abacus um, in the future but. It's, it's good to get a feel of what the PDEs are, to get familiar with, with them, because like I said, they describe most physical processes. And even though we focus mostly on the elasticity problem and the heat transfer problem, ideally, my expectation is that when you have a job that you need to solve some PDE or some physics, you might have more than just the elasticity and the heat transfer problem. So you might have you know, a fluid, problem or some electromagnetism, like I was saying, or some elasticity, but with some another, like a diffusion problem, a transport problem. I don't know. Depends on where you end up working. Uh, so I think getting just familiar with seeing the PDEs and, and seeing that they actually mean something, I think that's useful. Uh, second one for the coding part, I think just knowing how to code um, is important regardless of what, uh, you are not gonna code your own FE and make you code it, but you know, that is for sure in industry, you won't code your own FE, but I still think that forcing you to code in MATLAB or Python um, is a good skill to have because sometimes you need to post-process data that you get out of some software. Um, and you know, Excel can do a lot of things, but it cannot do it all. So if you need to plot a contour, for instance, um, or like I said, you need to do some post-processing with your data. I think it's useful to know at least some basic uh, Python programming to, to be able to do that. Um, so that's why I think that you need to, to know this. Another one is the middle one. Uh, using FE is more than just uh, doing CAD. Uh, this is more related to the Abacus uh, labs. We do relatively uh, simple examples with uh, Abacus, but I mean, some of the examples are really designed for you to see that if you just use random elements, you won't get the solution that is the correct one. So in the, for example, in the plate with a hole, depending on how you refine your mesh, you might get 
some really bad estimate of the stress concentration at the at the hole. And then I don't mind you to go design something that is going to break. You know, if you go design a plane, I want to be able to get on that plane and not feel like oh, one of my students designed this. I hope I don't die. Um, so I think knowing what the pitfalls are. So if you just use it as a CAD software, um, then it's likely that you're going to get a bad, uh, an unreliable result. So I think it's useful, the things that we do in Abacus, to force you to refine your mesh whenever you have you know, more stress gradients, um, to know that there are options for this reduced integration and normal integration for linear elements or quadratic elements, and to get a feel for you know, in what situations you might get some result that doesn't make sense. Um, so I think all those, those three things that are sort of the theory, the abacus, and the Python, um, I think are worth it, even if at the end of the day, I know you won't code your own FE. I think that's it. That's sort of the what we have covered in the class and why I think it is important, even if you don't code your own FE in the future. Questions? All right. So let's do a little bit of, uh, of the topic of the class, so verification and validation. Um, I think I uploaded this already because it should be there. Um, this is some recommendations from ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Um, what is the role of simulations? Uh, they help us design things, cars, uh, planes, weapons, and the how can they be useful if we trust the results of the of the simulation, right? So if they are trustworthy. Otherwise, it's just a colorful picture. So we need to make sure that whatever colorful pictures we generate, they actually have some meaning. Uh, that is the that is what I want. Like I said, I want to get on a plane that you designed, and I would don't wanna be nervous about that. So how do you um, I will skip this one. What is the main idea of uh, model development? You have some idea of what the physics, when we talk about conceptual model, you basically just have to be able to list the physics that you're interested in. So if you are designing a plane, for instance, you want to consider the fluid aspect of it for the lift, and you want to consider you know, the structural aspect of it to know if the, if the parts will fail. Then once you have a list of the physics that you are interested in, then the mathematical model is the actual PDE. So this is the actual PDE. And then for the numerical algorithm, this is FE. It most, this is not the only choice, uh, but it's a very popular one. And then once you decide that you go for FE, then you have to code it. And then when you run your simulations, you typically have two things that you can change. You can change the physical parameters, for example, material properties, you know, Young's modulus, Poisson ratio. Things that matter for your design, basically. your geometry. So all of these things that matter for your design. And then you also have parameters that relate to how you're solving the equations. So these are things like the element that you choose, element type, the mesh size, for example. So these are parameters that relate to how well do you solve the, the equations that you care about. And the combination of those two gives you a computational model that you can evaluate. And so there's two main tasks to make sure that that computational model is trustworthy. You wanna make sure that this is, can I trust this? So one is called verification. That's one of the safeguards that you need to do. 
That one is the process of determining that a computational model accurately represents the underlying mathematical modeling and its solution. Basically, am I solving the equations right? And the validation is the process of determining the degree to which a model is an accurate representation of the real world. And this one is more related to, did I choose the correct set of equations? So am I solving the correct equations? For example, let's say that you decide that you're gonna solve um, you know, the deformation of a part, and then you use uh, an isotropic material, for example. Sorry, yeah. isotropic material, like you did for the heat transfer problem. You did, for example, isotropic or an isotropic diffusion. Let's say that you pick isotropic diffusion, and then you do your verification part, you make sure that when you solve the, the isotropic diffusion problem, you're solving it correctly. But then you actually compare your results against some measurement, and then you are off. And then it may be that you are actually solving the problem correctly. Your mesh size is correct, your elements are correct, everything is correct, but you still cannot capture the real behavior. And that's not a problem of the solution of the equations, it's a problem of the equations themselves. You picked isotropic diffusion when the thing maybe has an, an isotropic diffusion. So I think you have to you have to check both. Typically, the verification part is just a coding part, and but the validation part is an experimental part. So the usual workflow is you have a conceptual model, which, like I said, is basically your list of the physics that you're interested in, and there's sort of two branches one branch that comes from the experimental side and one branch that comes from the coding side. Obviously in this class, we're mostly here. We're not really doing uh, any validation. In this class, we have a conceptual model, you know, from your senior design, you have um, some thing that you are, that you are designing, I don't know, bookshelf or, or something. Then out of that, you say, okay, what are the physics that I'm interested in? I'm just interested in the elasticity of that bookshelf. Then what are the equations that describe the elasticity? Is the, my usual equation, you know, the, we haven't really talked about elasticity, but my usual equation for elasticity with some material model, like a linear elastic model. Right, so this will be my, my equations. So elastic uh, linear momentum balance or mechanical equilibrium with a linear material. Let's say that this is my linear material, mechanical equilibrium. And then I'm gonna solve it with Fe. And for implementation, I'm just gonna use Abacus. And so I run some simulations and then I need to make sure that I am doing things correctly. The call verification, you don't really have to do. That one Abacus has done. What is code verification? The code verification is basically just making sure that you are calculating things correctly. You're doing the integrals correctly, that you're evaluating the shape functions correctly. It's basically the, you know, the individual parts of your, of your code, not of your simulation. 
So that one you have to worry about for my homeworks, but in terms of using Abacus, Abacus has done that for you. Whatever code you use, people have verified that, you know, the things are implemented correctly. Um, you still have to do this one. This one is basically related to the mesh size, the mesh element. So mesh size, element type. That you still have to worry about. So out of, out of this particular, even if you're using Abacus, you still have to do that one. So you basically have to look out for, you know, it's my solution. Uh, you've done the, mesh conversions, you have done that for the plate with a hole. So basically you need to refine your mesh and then see you should approach some uh, given value for the, for the quantity of interest. And then you can stop refining your mesh. Um, and maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, you've done it in the context of when you have an analytical solution, that's another one that I've asked you to do for your project. So in your project, for instance, you have some part that you're interested in and we cannot do experiments, so we cannot do that. But what we can do is you can pick a problem for which there is an analytical solution and that is closely related to your problem. And then what I'm asking you to do for your project is to do the fine element solution for the problem for which we have an analytical solution to make sure that you can get the correct mesh type the correct element, the correct mesh size. And then once you are confident that you can capture the analytical model, then you can tweak your geometry or your loading to match your the problem that you're interested in. So that's part of this calculation verification. Again, Abacus has already done this. Abacus has coded correctly the shape functions, is doing correctly the integrals. But when you discretize the model, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get the correct solution. You still need to Again, define this mesh size and element type. Um, yeah, so there's two there's two typical things that you do here. You do mesh convergence analysis and you do comparison to analytical problems. Then once you do that, then you are happy with your mesh size and with your element type, then you can actually run your, your simulations. One thing that we haven't really talked about much, but it is important, is this uncertainty quantification part. Um, so right now, I don't know if I wrote it in the into the project, but move this a little bit. But one thing that you want to know is, let's say that you are solving again some of your, of your senior design projects, you have some part, you find some analytical problem that is closely related, you use that to do the mesh convergence and some comparison with that analytical model. Then you can run simulations there's still some uncertainty associated with the parameters that you are choosing. So when you're doing your simulation, maybe you choose a load, right? That, you know, you think that this bookshelf will carry this many books, but what if it doesn't? So what if there's some uncertainty and there's less books or more books? Um, so what if you say, I'm doing it out of steel or aluminum and it has a Young's modulus of whatever, 70 gigapascals. But what if it's not exactly 70 gigapascals? What if it's you know a little bit softer or a little bit uh, stiffer? Then ideally what you do is you run multiple simulations changing those parameters. Change 
changing design parameters or uncertain parameters. So either things that you're not completely sure about or things that you are thinking about changing. You know, if you are designing again, some some part for your for your the, the Baja team, and then you are unsure if you can save some weight by you know making some holes in the part, and then maybe that's one thing that you want to explore. So maybe you want to change the shape a little bit, uh, save some material. So you want to run multiple simulations, not just one, but you change either your design parameters or parameters that you're uncertain about. That's it on the on the coding side. And then what you don't do in this class, but you should be doing in your, for example, senior design, is you should be integrating it with some experimental work. So typically, you also try to find some simplified physical model, maybe not your entire part. You don't, you know, for planes, you don't want to test the whole plane, uh, but some part of it. And then you want to check that you can do some experiments that reflect more or less the real world, world case, not exactly the last, uh, you know, the whole plane at the beginning, maybe just some components of it. Um, and you want to measure and compare your experimental outcomes with your simulation outcomes. And this one is the validation, which again, we don't do in this class because we will need some experimental data, but it's very important in general. I don't think we have a class where we do everything. Even in your senior design, I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, you do some physical prototype and you do some of the, of the modeling work. I don't know how much you do of the, of the validation part, but ideally you basically compare um, as you go along, as you are refining your design, you compare some experimental component with some of the simulation work to basically just be sure that what you are simulating is correct. If there is no agreement, that means that you probably are missing something, either because the thing is not isotropic or because there's some damage and not just elastic the, uh, uh, deformation, there's maybe some plasticity um, or you ignore the fluid, I don't know. Uh, otherwise, if they agree, then you can just continue using that model to refine your, your design. Any questions? All right. So, yes, this is, like I said, the, the two main parts. Code verification is what Abacus has done already. Is basically, is the shape function implemented correctly? Is the integration um, implemented correctly? The calculation verification is more related to the, to the discretization. So, like I said, this one is more related to your element type. to your mesh size. This one is more related to are the shape functions correct, for example. Some of the tests that I don't make you do, but Abacus does to make sure that their, their elements are coded correctly, um, is they do this patch test they are called. Um, which is basically, you know, a simple mesh where you can just check that things make sense. So if you stretch it in one direction, then you should get some uniform strain field. Um, so just very, very simple meshes for which you can calculate solutions. So Abacus has done that. I'm not uh, going to ask you to do that. I am going to ask you to, uh, in homework five, I'm going to ask you to solve a heat transfer problem and I will provide an analytical solution. Um, and then you can also compare, you know, is my, uh, is my analytical solution being recovered my, by my FE mesh? Yeah, like I said, calculation verification is basically the things that you can do in Abacus. Even if Abacus has done the code verification, this is what you should still do.
primarily the, the two that I'm really, really interested in is mesh convergence analysis. I do want to see that. And I want you to just care for this in your, in your, in your project and in your abacus exam. Uh, these two are the most important ones. Element type, you have some freedom. You should know. The other two, I think, are mostly uh, in the integration. So this one, reduced integration or full integration. This one, linear or quadratic. Um, triangular or quadrilateral. Mesh quality is basically is it very distorted or or uniform? There is not definitive answer as to which one you should use. Um, I would say some rules of thumb. I think quadratic is good because you can do, so quadratic re reduced integration is a good first, uh, typically doesn't require super fine meshes and it's not too computationally intensive we, we do the reduced integration so typical situations this will work um, I think you should watch out for watch out for distorted elements. In some cases, it's just very difficult to get um, also quadrilateral. They usually are um, a little bit more flexible so we can capture the solution better without it, uh, too many elements. Or in 3D, this will be the hex element. Yes. What do you mean by distorted? Like just visually distorted? Or? Yes. I mean, there's element uh, quality uh, plots in, in Alacos. I don't think we have done it. I don't know if, um, I don't remember if it's in any of the labs. But you can actually ask Alacos to plot the, uh, the aspect ratio of the elements. And so you can single out elements that look, yeah. But you can also do it visually. So visually, but there are metrics. I don't know if we if we cover cover it. There are metrics on Alcos for bad quality elements, and there are warnings in the in the statistics file. That will say, you know, elements so and so are extremely distorted. So you can go back and check. So you can do it visually. In some cases, obviously in 3D it's more difficult. Um, but in 2D, for example, for the bending problems that you were doing, you can clearly see some of the, these, they are called hourglass modes. Um, That one, I think you've done for, um, for the lab with the, with the bending, right? So if you use reduced integration, hopefully you look at that, but if you use the linear reduced integration for the, so you use the linear reduced integration, then you see that there's, there's these patterns that look weird. You get the, 
this deformation where the elements kind of look like uh, trape trapezoids. They look like this. And they allow for a lot of deflection. Do you do that in, uh, in the pin bending one? If you use linear quadrilateral with reduced integration for this bending dominated problem, you get deflections that are ridiculous, like a meter or something like that. That just don't make sense. And if you look at how the elements deform, they, are, they accommodate these big deformations because they have these so-called zero energy modes. And basically, that means that there's ways, particular ways in which the element can deform that take up very little energy um, because you are not capturing, because you are not integrating correctly the, the energy. So then they go into this, they go into this, uh, these weird shapes, and then you get this sort of pattern across the, across the mesh. And yeah, and like I said, for example, for the these bending dominated problems, you just get these huge deflections that don't make sense. Um, so in that in that problem, for example, uh, I think that one was lab four, what lab lab, lab five, in lab five, yes, lab five. Uh, pro hopefully, you saw the quadratic elements, for example. Even with reduced integration, do okay. Um, quadratic with full integration, they do, they do, they do pretty well. Um, otherwise, if you use linear elements, you can still get the correct solution, but you just need a lot of linear elements with full integration across the, the width of your of your beam. I don't know how many you had to do for lab five. You probably started with one, and then you did two and four. Do you do four up to four across the So eight for, for linear elements with full integration, I think that one should work, for instance. Um, whereas with the quadratic, you're probably good with maybe two or, three or four uh, with the full integration. I don't remember what the, what the table was, uh, but these are the trade-offs between, you know, if you use linear elements, they are cheaper because it's linear functions, but you might need eight elements across the thickness to get a good result. Uh, quadratic elements are more expensive because you need to evaluate quadratic polynomials. They need a lot more integration points, but you might need less, so four. Um, and it's difficult to judge when, when is one cheaper than the, than the other. So I would say, you know, quadratic reduced integration is a good first guess. Um, but then you, what you have to do is you have to, again, see if the mesh is distorted. Um, I don't think we have used the abacus uh, functions to isolate distorted elements, but there are abacus functions to isolate distorted elements. Um, mesh convergence, what I mean by mesh convergence is even for your problem of interest, like I said, I, one thing that I ask you to do for your project is, let's say you have your your part that you're interested in and it looks something like that and it has some load like this, right? And it's kind of fixed here and fixed here. Um, and let's say that you don't have, this is the part that you want to do, right? And I don't have an analytical solution for that, but I have an analytical solution for, let's say this other problem for which I know sort of a similar load and then have this so it's not exactly the same this definitely won't give us the same result but i would say as a first i would say for this i have an analytical solution so i'm gonna first of all try to at least get some idea of what mesh will give me the correct the correct solution for for that. I think that's one thing that I, that's exactly why I'm asking you to do that in your project. So once you do that, you at least get a good idea of, you know, what elements and what element size.
right? So when you get that to match with the, with the analytical, then you have an idea of, oh, you know, quadratic, this mesh size, that works well. Um, then you can go ahead and solve your problem. And you still need to do this thing, the, the mesh convergence, still mesh convergence for this. Even though you have a good estimate based on, on this, what you should do is once you, so let's say that you solve the analytical problem, it was okay. And now you're moving on to your problem of interest, which is not exactly the same. And you kind of use the same element type and more or less the same mesh as you had done for the analytical problem. And it will be a good start. It definitely will be a good start. So now you have, you know, using element type and mesh size from analytical problem. But obviously, when you change the geometry, you will get slightly different stress concentrations. So you might have to refine your mesh a little bit. So what I would do is I would pick the point of interest. Let's say that you are interested in this point because you think that it might fail here because that maybe that's the... the one with the highest stress. So then what I would do is I would still refine my mesh to see if the, if the solution changes or not. You don't have to refine it a lot, but ideally what you want to see is you want to see that as you change your mesh size, one over your mesh size. So as your mesh size becomes smaller, you want to get the stress to, to settle at a point, right? So ideally what you want is you want your stress to convert, this is why it's called conversions. So you should converge at a point as you refine your mesh. So you do some of that already when you are doing your analytical problem, but even when you have your actual problem, you just want to make sure that you are here, you know, and you are not here. You definitely want to check that if you refine your mesh, the stress doesn't change by, you know, more than 10%. That one is a design choice. How much are you comfortable with this change? You know, below 5% would be okay, but if you, you were recovering the analytical solution then you have your actual part that you're interested in, you refine the mesh a little bit, and then suddenly your stresses change by, you know, 15%. Then I would do one more to make sure that now I'm, I'm settled. So between here and here, there's really no much change. But you know, for your actual problem, you don't need to do that many because you've done already most of the work by comparing with your analytical problem. You have a good idea of the element size and the and the element type. Here, you just want to double check, make sure that indeed this this mesh works for for your problem of interest. Questions. Da, da, da. Like I was saying, I don't know if I asked for this in the project, uh, but typically you don't run one simulation only. Typically you need to run more, more than one simulation because there's things that you're not completely sure about. So there's multiple parameters as I was mentioning. 
there's the, the mesh parameters, those are fixed. Once you do the, your solution, you check that you have the correct mesh and everything. But then there's still things that you either want to change because it's part of your design, like you want to adjust the geometry a little bit, uh, or there's things that you're not completely sure about, like the material that you're using, maybe there's some uncertainty in your, in your material properties, or the loading, maybe there's some uncertainty in the, in the loading. So ideally, in most cases, you never run just one simulation, but you actually sample, you know, some range of material parameters, some range of boundary conditions, and then you evaluate, and you want to make sure that your stress doesn't change by a lot, right? So you want to make sure that you're designing a part, you, you don't want it to fail, but you want to make sure that you don't want to fail for the material that you chose, but also even if the material has some small defects and maybe it's not 60 gigapascal, but it's, you know, 55 giga, gigapascal, you still want to make sure that you have some, some buffer there. Um, I think that's it. Validation, again, we don't do really that in this class. That requires uh, having some experimental data. But in typical you know, engineering situations in industry, you would have to also do that part. You want to make sure that your predictions with the model actually match reality. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it on the slides. But even though we don't do it in class, I think it's important for you to know that you can measure stress or you can measure strain in an experimental setting with strain gauges, load cells, and digital image correlation, photoelasticity. I don't know if you do any of this in, in 323 or no. I think now they are doing a lab for um, stress analysis. So there's a bunch of things that you can measure to make sure that you get some experimental um, strain field or stress field. Um, the last one is this is another strong form to weak form. This one I made the the case in the homework three. Was it homework three that I made you solve the one with the advection problem? Um, FE works, and there's one thing that we don't really talk about much in this class, except for that homework three that I made you go and, and do. Um, you just have to be careful for advection problems. So problems that have transport, they look like this. They have this extra velocity times the gradient of temperature, for example, for the convection. Those problems, and you, that's, that's the one that you did in homework three, they can be unstable if the, if the advection part is high. Um, so you will get, what do I mean by unstable? You will see this type of, of, uh, of oscillations in 1D and in 2D you will see sort of checkerboard patterns. And that should be a hint that, you know, things oscillating a lot is probably not realistic. This is not real. This is actually an artifact of the, um, of the model. And we don't really use it in class. This is just for you to know that particular problems that have um, advection, if you ever have to solve them with ANSYS or with Abacus or COMSO, um, just be aware that they can be unstable and you should just look for there's stabilization options in, in FE software. I would say read the, the documentation. Or ask. But that's that's really for the heat transfer. For the elasticity, we'll talk about, about that in sort of the last part of the of the course. And then I'll, there's also a bunch of problems in elasticity that require some special treatment. But in terms of the scalar problem, the, the heat transfer problem. If it's just diffusion, no issue. You can just use, uh, you don't even need to think much about it um, except for the mesh size. Uh, but if there is some advection term, then you have to worry about it because you might get uh, a lot of unrealistic oscillations. So just be aware of that for the heat transfer problem.
that's it. Okay, just a lot of recommendations for today. That's all I have. And this is the last of today. And then that's it. This is all that is covered for this block. We'll do some problems on Monday and Wednesday of next week.